and concerns do people have a thought an honoring a, a hope does anyone have and last week here in Nelson was homeless <coughs> week okay. and homeless action week and we had I, I went I went to all the meetings and uh, we really we really had some good meetings and we really got together and talked about how we can help to help to house people who need need houses. So uh, that's what I'm going to light my candle to. Uh, let's yeah, that's okay. Let, let's uh, find ways of housing everyone in a healthy way. Yes. <coughs> my name's Keith. Everybody. <laughs> Um, I'm lighting a candle for um, uh, my visit to Edmonton last week. I wasn't here. I was in Edmonton visiting my mother and my sister for Thanksgiving. And I went to Westwood Unitarian uh, there where I went for a number of years before we moved away. And I saw so many familiar faces and it was, it was, I got a very warm welcome from them. And they knew about us here. They had heard of us and they even, some of them even knew that we were having our, our, our membership uh, uh, belonging ceremony next week. So they'd heard about that. So they're very well connected. So, nice. Um, while others are thinking about what they want to say, I would just like to um, say one thing in response, and that um, Anne has received a beautiful card from the Saskatchewan Unitarians. And uh, when she showed it to me this morning, I discovered that their minister is Karen Gitlitz. <laughs> Fraser, Karen Fraser Gitlitz, who 
we saw grow up in the Unitarian Church of Vancouver. And it was what a heartening thing. And, and they too know all about us and are congratulating us and welcoming us into the Unitarian family, which is pretty, pretty exciting. So I'd like to have a, a thanks to all the Unitarians who are welcoming us. And yeah. why don't you pass it around? Yes, pass it. Yeah. Just leave it out of the envelope. I would like to light a candle for my brother and wife who came, came here for a visit and we had a wonderful visit and uh, so I'm thankful for the coming and uh, um, and light a candle for them. Where did they come from, Anne? They came from a, a little community that's uh, near Salmon Arm. It's across the lake. And uh, they live on the beach there. <laughs> Very nice. I'm Karen. And I'm lighting a candle of concern. Um, a, a friend called me about her son who is mentally ill and he is either in the hospital or in jail in Vancouver. Right now he's in jail. Otherwise he's on the street or in the hospital. And she is so stressed that I'm lighting this candle for both her and her son. I'm John, and I wanted to have a lesson from nature, that the beautiful trees, the leaves on the trees, are showing us what a beautiful way it is to let go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, John. It's wonderful. My name is Katarina. And I want to thank you for your prayer and I praying for myself to learn how to let go, especially in the mornings. I'm so crazy. So please, Great Spirit, help me to let go. to the universe and to our friends and neighbors. Um, we gave a house concert yesterday and we had, including ourselves, 30 people. <laughs> and it was, it was a, a delight. And, you know, so we'll have to do it again sometime and invite some of these people, more of these people here. I think we did. We did invite some of you. I'm just going to say. Oh, and then there were, yeah, there were a couple people. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Anyway, thank you. Just a uh, thank you to the universe. And I will light the last candle of today for all of the unspoken or not quite ready to be expressed joys and concerns that we find in our hearts. And we will um, begin our day, if you have a copy of the order of service, um, on the back page 
is um, a song by Malvina Reynolds. <coughs> Malvina Reynolds uh, is one of the women that we will be acknowledging today, a Unitarian in history, who um, was an absolutely amazing singer-songwriter. And, um, <laughs> and if you've ever heard the song Little Boxes, a variety of people have sung it, but Malvina Reynolds wrote it and sang it on her albums. Um, and this is, you know, some of hers go on a little longer, and I thought, no, too long for us, but if you ever want to hear them, YouTube has quite a good selection. Um, so we're gonna begin our um, service with a song, and uh, it's called Magic Penny, but I sometimes uh, think of it as, Love is something if you give it away, which is the first line. So stand as you are willing and able. And this is Melvin Reynolds on the screen. <coughs> Until winter. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was um, some children in the, you know, in the uh, Sunday school were, were drawing pictures. And the teacher said, What are you drawing? He says, Well, I'm drawing a picture of God. The teacher says, Well, no one knows what God looks like. And they said, Well, they will in a minute when I'm through. <laughs> 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 well, then of course there's uh, the bumper sticker for oh, Unitarians, yeah. which um, honk if you're not sure. <laughs> 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 
And uh, the answer is to question. Okay. And uh, <laughs> that goes over like That's a lead balloon, eh? <laughs> bumper sticker. That's a bumper sticker. Okay, well, that, that humor um, and meditation. Yeah. I'm meditating on um, sort of what it means to be a Unitarian and to have a sense of humor. And we'll now take a few moments to um, have a bit of a meditation today. It says in the program that <laughs> uh, which Dale made up. Did you um, make it up, Dale? As <laughs> <laughs> he went along. <laughs> that um, that this is an inspirational talk, and um, I hope so. I certainly am inspired by the research and the people that I have met in history who have been Unitarians. But mostly I'm focused on, on women. Uh, because I found it so incredible that many people that we are very familiar with, um, we did not know that they were Unitarians. Um, and so, while I could cover, and I certainly have enough material <laughs> to go on and on and on, um, when I gave this the first time, people indicated that they wanted to have more. And since I was service leader this month and searching for, uh, without a great deal of time to go out and find people, um, I decided to pull on this study that I had thought I wanted to do. And so I will be sharing with you some of the women from history who are Unitarians or Universalists, or in some cases, women who have chosen um, religious freedom and not to be tied to any one religion, but associated themselves regularly with the Unitarians and Universalists in their communities. Um, There were a number of activist areas that I found. Uh, so so I, I looked at a number of different sites, some of which were in last week's pro or October 1st's program. <coughs> okay, extra copies if you want to look at those. And, and then I found uh, a fascinating site on Harvard University. Now, Harvard, um, d for many years, or historically did not let women in, first of all, to their university at all, and secondly, to their theology school. Um, and Unitarian, Unitarian women were the first to continue to bang hard enough on those doors that opened them up. Um, and now, and, and and what we found, what I found when I was looking at their website and all of the different people that they have listed there, men and women, that initially it was the husbands who were there, they were professors or this or that, but the women were 
uh, banging on the doors, single women who wanted to be theologians and wanted to be ministers. Um, and so finally those doors were broken. <coughs> so one area is the sort of activist area of trying to get into becoming Unitarian ministers or ministers of any kind. <laughs> Um, and many Unitarians were very active in pressuring that all across North America. Um, we, we know about Emily Stowe, who I talked about last time. And the fascinating thing was we had dinner um, this past week with um, our neighbors who are only come for like six weeks, three, four times a year. And their, their granddaughter was with them. And and she got really excited. In fact, I thought they might even come today um, because she had just done a major study on Dr. Emily Stowe and was amazed to find out that she was a Unitarian because she had just done a major report on this woman and nowhere was it mentioned. Hmm. It's funny the way that part of ourselves gets buried and not made public because um, Unitarians are not a proselytizing group. We don't go out and go, hey, you know, we are the truth and the way. <laughs> um, we just, each of us, choose to find our way here. Um, but, um, you know, she was the first woman to practice medicine in Canada. And she had to go to New York <laughs> in order to get her medical degree because there wasn't a university in Canada that would let a woman in to medicine. Um, but then she came back to Canada and did get into uh, practice medicine in the hospitals. But she, along with so many other Unitarian women in history, were active suffragists for the vote for women and also abolitionists um, against slavery in the United States and Canada. Uh, and, and, and made great effort to bring, uh, to make the lives of, of slaves who came across the border a, a home here in Canada. So um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to list them completely because that's way, way too big a task. I am going to focus on a few. Um, uh, I, I talked last time about uh, Mary White Ovington, who was the, a co-founder of the NAACP. She was a white woman, um, but she was absolutely honored by the NAACP uh, in their, um, she, there's a, a plaque to her in their headquarters. It's, uh, you know, so there were, there were white, white people active in the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People in the United States. And some of them were Canadians. <laughs> um, I talked about Beatrix Potter and Louisa May Alcott. Um, you know, in terms of literary contributions, but I didn't talk about um, the kind of other, other women. Elizabeth Cleghorn Gaskell was a lively, attractive young woman who married William Gaskell. And he was an assistant minister at the Cross Street Unitarian Chapel in Manchester, England. Now, if you're aware of history very much, and even today, you'll know that Manchester is a um, industrial town. And the lives, historically, of the people who worked in those factories were uh, the kind of lives that Bread and Roses talks about. Um, lives should not be sweated from birth until life closes. And uh, Elizabeth Cleghorn Gaskell felt the same way. Um, in 18, now she lived from 1810 to 1865. And in 1845, Frederick Engels described the homes of factory operatives in, quote, the conditions of working class in England, the workers' dwellings of Manchester are dirty, miserable, and wholly lacking in comforts. 
In such houses, only inhuman, degraded, and unhealthy creatures would feel at home. And Engels, of course, was a Marxist and a socialist and wanted, uh, well, he wasn't a Marxist, he was working with Marx, uh, side by side, <laughs> um, a socialist, uh, and really wanting to see life change. And in 1848, um, uh, Elizabeth Claycorn Gaskell published her first no novel anonymously. Uh, it was entitled uh, Mary Barton, uh, A Tale of Manchester Life. And, and it was um, such, a, had, had such a huge impact on the reading public that it, it provoked widespread discussion, uh, the appalling state of impoverished workers in the industrial centers of the North, and her sympathetic treatment of their plight pricked the conscience of a nation. And um, throughout her working and writing life, she continued to write and bring to people's attention the um, importance of changing the lives of those people who were being so uh, desperately impacted by the poverty and industrial exploitation. Um, and, and so it's, it's just interesting. Mm -hmm. To, to think. She was such a strong influence during that time. Others who had literary, I, I call it literary influence and environmental preservation because um, I, I had talked about, um, uh, who, was, who was it, somebody else, L last, last time, who gave all of her land to the, to the trust. Beatrice Potter. Beatrice Potter. Beatrice Potter, that's right. Um, well, um, Fanny Farmer of cookbook fame was a Unitarian. Um, and so I, I call it environmental preservation because um, her recipes are, are healthy recipes and some are not. But then Francis Moore Lappe, I think you pronounce it. Um, is the author of Diet for a Small Planet and mm -hmm. Recipes for a Small Planet. Mm -hmm. Francis was a Unitarian. Mm -hmm. I just think it's it's so interesting. Probably to go still with. is. I think she's still alive. Uh, Francis is still alive. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. She actually was born the same year as me, forty six. Um, yeah. And and so I just find going back and and seeing these people who. I mean, these books had a, a major influence on all the generations since <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. in terms of the way that we think about eating and preserving the planet at the same time. So uh, thank, thanks to that. And um, then, then another author that tells a whole different side of stories around Unitarian was May Sarton. Um, how many people are familiar with May Sarton's literary works? Um, at 19, in 1931, she traveled to Europe and lived in Paris while her parents were in Lebanon. And it marked a lifelong adventure of annually, an, annually visiting Europe. Um, and she actually wanted to start her life being in theater. <laughs> <laughs> That's me. <laughs> um, and she published her, her first novel, uh, The Single Hound, in 1938. Um, she, I just, in so many of the stories that I've been reading about the lives of Unitarian women, uh, we have those who have married um, and had a very fulfilled life, you know, either with Unitarian ministers or with scientists that shared their interests and supported them in their own work. Um, and many were referred to as having, quote, Boston marriages. <laughs> <laughs> or intimate friends <laughs> who they lived with. 
Um, and, and these are women of note, women who were incredibly well respected in their time. Um, and, and those times were times when the homophobia was rampant in the world. And yet, uh, by not identifying themselves as out lesbians, but living openly with the people that they loved, um, they made places for themselves in the world that ended up giving them platforms from which to speak uh, a lot of truth. And so, uh, May Sarton was one of these. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go a little bit deeply into some of these stories because I just find them so, so interesting. Um, it's, uh, oh, well. Okay, I don't have all the papers that I want. Um, so I can only talk a little bit about May. Um, she had the opportunity and was supported by many people around uh, uh, the United States to produce books that were social commentary. They were warm, loving, stories of the history of people that she knew, but they were fictionalized. And, um, and yet, those stories were social commentary. And, and they were incredibly widely read. This, this person, um, it was funny because, I mean, I read a couple of her books and, you know, somewhat enjoyed them. They were, you know, stunningly active for me, but yet when I read her biography or her listed, how she was listed in different things, I found that they influenced, I'm not like everybody else. There, there are a lot of people in the world who are very different from me and the way I think and be, and you might call them sort of the middle class, and you might call them um, of the upper middle class, you might call them lots of different things. Um, but they were influenced, very strongly influenced by her social commentary. And, and I, I just think, you know, it's great because other people need to be, <laughs> many people need to be influenced. Um, and, and I will say that um, The end of the 30s was a creative time for Sarton. In 1940, she undertook what was to become annual poetry reading lecture tours of colleges throughout the United States, beginning in Santa Fe, New Mexico. In the 40s, she worked at Pearl Buck's East and West Society, writing documentary scripts for the United States War Information Office while continuing to produce poetry and novels. Finally, in 1946, her novel, The Bridge of Years, was published, followed two years later by the volume of poetry, The Lion and the Rose. Um, and she had as much to do with um, artists and writers, and, and the circles of, of those people influenced each other. Um, you know, Auden, Stillwells, Dame Edith, etc. Um, and I guess the last one I, of the literary group I wanted to mention was um, Dorothy Livesey. And I did talk a little bit about Dorothy last year, uh, that she had, had quite an influence. Then the, so, the social activists, people like Margaret Sanger, who I just mentioned at the end of last year, last time, and I wanted to talk a little bit more deeply about Margaret Sanger. Um, though her anarchist, socialist, political activities and strikes kept her busy, Margaret worked as a nurse, focusing on sexual and women's health issues. She worked primarily in the Lower East Side with women suffering from frequent childbirth, abortion, and miscarriage. 
and influenced by her friend Emma Goldman, who is one of my greatest heroes in the universe, <laughs> came to see family planning and sex education as methods by which working class women could address the economic hardships of unwanted pregnancies. Now, <laughs> In, 19, in 1873, the Comstock laws and similar legislation in 24 states prohibited the transport of, quote, obscene, lewd, or lascivious material by the U.S. Postal Service, which included contraceptives and information about abortion. Sanger was indicted in violation of these laws in August 1914 for publishing a feminist monthly newsletter, The Woman Rebel, which advocated the use of contraception for family limitation. She paid her bail, but instead of appearing in criminal court for breaking federal law, she sailed to England using the name Bertha Watson. She left behind, however, 100,000 copies of a detailed pamphlet to use uh, on the use of several contraceptive methods, which she ordered her friends to distribute, which, of course, they did. Uh, she did come back and uh, did spend some time in jail. And she was arrested several more times um, for being a proponent of family planning practices for women, contraceptive practices. Um, <coughs> she discovered that the most effective method of contraception was a diaphragm, which unfortunately needed to be fitted by medical professionals. In response, she returned to New York City and opened the first birth control clinic and was arrested for that. This clinic paved the way for increased medical attention to be paid to the issues of birth control education. So Sanger founded the American Birth Control League to drum up mainstream public support for the cause. In the late 20s and 30s, Sanger's movement had turned the attention to advocacy for federal exceptions to the Comstock laws for physicians and from the feminist sex positive attitudes of Sanger herself to more mainstream American values. She retired in 1952 to help organize the international branch of Planned Parenthood Federation, an organization created by the merger of other groups founded by Sanger decades earlier. She continued to organize funding for the research and development of the birth control pill which made its appearance in American <coughs> markets in 1960. The market for oral contraceptives faced its own legislative battle, which was addressed first by the land, uh, landmark Supreme Court decision, Griswold uh, versus Connecticut, which allowed contraceptives for married straight couples and a woman's right to privacy for, uh, for abortion, and then um, paved the way for contraceptive use for single people just a few months over the Griswold, after the Griswold case was settled in September 1966. At the age of 86, Margaret Sanger passed away in Houston, in, in Tucson, Arizona. My goodness, when you think about the way that woman changed the world, <laughs> yay, thank goodness, and we're very lucky for that. Um, and then, and then we have Ida Maud Cannon. She's a pioneer in hospital social service. Like there was a man who started sort of the first one hospital, a social service department, um, in a hospital, recognizing that the that the lived lives of many of the people that he was seeing in his clinics or in his hospital practice who were dying. That, that it was a question of, of um, the ways in which they lived. It was a question of the poverty in which they lived. It was a question of their need for uh, uh, child uh, benefit, child care. And so Ida Moyd Cannon, she, she worked for him. And she ended up setting up um, hospital social service movements um, throughout uh, New England in the 20th century. The theory and practice of medical social work during her 39 years with Massachusetts General Hospital, and it became it became a um, a place where people came to train to be medical social workers all across the United States and perhaps Canada as well. 
So hospital social work, um, many, many, many people have benefited as a result of that. Um, she accepted the position of Chief of Social Service um, at Massachusetts General, and um, she was frequently hosted by other states and other countries to help them set up similar programs. As a Unitarian, she saw the church as an important player in community social service. She'd go, grown concerned that the relationship between the church and local social agencies in Boston were weakening, and uh, she worked to make those much stronger. In 1918, she co-founded the American Association of Hospital Social Workers and incorporated that into the National Association of Social Workers in 1955. You know, these are, these are big things that happened. Um, fighting tuberculosis was one of Cannon's priorities, perhaps owing to her mother's death from the disease. Um, for her generation, she was the symbol of hospital social service. Today, she's celebrated for her remarkable contributions <coughs> to medical social work. And she was honored with many advanced degrees and such. Um, now, another, another person who, a black woman who moved from uh, the North where she didn't face a lot of discrimination growing up. She decided to um, move to the South and teach, and she experienced more discrimination there than she had faced in the North, and she became passionate about working for the rights of African American women. Fanny Barrier Williams from 1855 to 1944, and those certainly were significant in the time of the Civil War and post-Civil War and early civil rights movements and, and, and such. Um, as a Unitarian, she was one of the first leaders to identify housing segregation and limited employment opportunities as crucial issues for racial justice. Through her many speeches and co-founding of interracial organizations, she championed the rights of African Americans and worked to ensure their recognition and inclusion and, and, she is, um, and she is only a, a representative sample of the incredibly large number of Unitarians, um, particularly Unitarian women, who were abolitionists in the 1800s and who worked for civil rights in the 1900s mm -hmm. and uh, continue today, of course. Um, and, and I... Another, another of those is a woman named Margaret Mosley, um, who lived from 1901 to 1997. She was a Unitarian Universalist, and she was denied entrance to every nursing program in Boston because of her race. So instead, she became a civil rights activist founded a consumer cooperative and served on the board of the Civil Liberties Association of Massachusetts, as well as a founding member of Freedom House, a leader of the anti-McCarthyism movement through the 1950s. She also helped to form NAACP chapters throughout Cape Cod, the second UU community cooperative house in Boston's Jamaica Plains neighborhood will, will be named for Mosley. Um, And when you go back in and you read their backstory, you can see, you know, the influences, the things that push them in one direction or another. But the fact is that it was for many of them, their Unitarian faith and the notion of social justice as part of a basic groundwork of Unitarian faith, one of the basic principles. Um, I, I read in many of the stories that, um, that it was this guiding principle that had such great influence in the lives of these women. Um, and, where are we here? Okay. Simon.
science. I have a couple of wonderful scientists. Celia Payne Gaposchkin from 1900 to 1979. Cecilia was the first woman to receive tenure and the first chair of a department in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Harvard University. Now, Harvard University is a place that has uh, quite an incredible um, um, series of web pages listing of um, UU Unitarian Universalist people in the United States and some from Canada. And um, more than that, um, you can click on those and go into their history. Um, and and that, I think that's because Boston conquered uh, Massachusetts. Massachusetts was a hotbed of Unitarian and Universalist thought in America. And, um, and, and Harvard University became, after a lot of banging on the doors and knocking to get in, now they honor those people. <laughs> Hooray for them. So Cecilia was an astronomer who discovered that hydrogen is millions of times more abundant than any other element in the universe. Along with many more scientific breakthroughs, she also taught Sunday school at First Parish in Lexington, Massachusetts. During a time when the sciences were even more dominated by men than they are today, her persistence and brilliance made incredible strides for women in the um, and I, I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm, I, mentioned, I mentioned them, uh, I mentioned them, oh yeah, Carrie Chapman Catt started the League of Women Voters in the United States. She was an abolitionist and a pacifist and a suffragist. Um, when did the woman get? Votes in the US and Canada? What in Canada, we got the vote in uh, 1919, I believe. It was different in every province. Quebec did not get the vote until 1940, which is the sort wow. of historic. <laughs> right. Women did not have the vote until 1940 in Quebec. So, but in Saskatchewan, I think it was 1919 or 19, and, and uh, I think British Columbia was 1920. You know, so it was different in every province. You know, I guess provincial had some sort of sway over who got to vote federally and provincially. And do you know the United States offhand? Uh, the United States was uh, 1919 to begin with. Yeah. yeah. And, and that was... And, and all the states but, were different. But all those women who worked for abolition uh, of slavery and right, civil rights for, for black people, um, the men, black men, got the vote before women did in the United States. Scandinavia was 16, 17, and 18. 16, 17, 18. My mom was born 1917, uh -huh. and I think it was the year before and the year after, depending what right. Scandinavia was. So there was something in the air before, yeah. <laughs> at that time. But fascinating, I just found it fascinating that all of these women worked so hard for the vote and for also for abolition of slavery and rights for civil civil rights, and and yet they didn't get the vote when the black men did, which I thought was typical. <laughs> now um, I'm I'm going to close with two people. I hope we uh, you know have a few extra minutes um, because I did want to talk about Margot Adler, who I didn't get to talk about last time. Margot Adler um, lived from 1946 to 2014, and she was a pagan Unitarian. And, and she wrote um, Drawing Down the Moon, which is a wonderful uh, reflective book about being pagan and what it means and how to do it. <laughs> um, and, and was what, what they are saying as a seminal work on neo-paganism in America. 
She was a member of the Unitarian Church of All Souls in New York City and the Covenant of Unitarian Universalist Pagans and a frequent speaker uh, at national and regional Unitarian Universalist events. I'm not going to talk a lot about her childhood, but um, her father, she was the only grandchild of Alfred Adler, a renowned Austrian doctor who had been a contemporary of Freud and Jung in Vienna. Um, her mother was the daughter of unschooled immigrants, both dead by the time she was born. Um, uh, the, the, she worked the, the, the grandmother is dead, but the mother was an inspiration. Auntie Maine, she, she likened her to Auntie Maine, who was another of my favorite people in the universe, whether she was false or you know, just on the screen. Um, her fat, both her, uh, her sides of her family came from Jewish families, although none of them practiced the religion. She grew up in Manhattan, in Greenwich Village. She called it my utopia, and the place that remained whole and intact and vibrant, even when my own family fell apart. Her, par her, mother, her parents' married, a marriage faltered, and um, the school, the city and country school, helped her weather the school. She fell in love with the stories of gods and goddesses, and I was too. I, I got, as a child, that, you know, I, I learned all the myths. I learned all, I studied them all. Um, and she developed a love of singing and performance that led her to enroll in the high school of music and art. She was a freshman at the University of Calgary, Berkeley, in 1964 when the free, free speech movement erupted. And it, it, when the university imposed limits on the right to meet and organize around political issues, and um, specifically to enlist volunteers in the civil rights movement, campus protests, and finally a sit in at Sproul Hall. The university's administration building resulted in the largest mass arrest of students in the nation's history. Like her mother, Adler embraced political activism. She was drawn by the issues and felt them deeply. She decided to go to jail rather than pay a $250 fine, so she was in prison for three weeks in the Santa prison farm. She volunteered to work at the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party registering American voters, African American voters in Mississippi, and my sister uh, did that also, going down on a bus to Mississippi to register voters. So I sort of felt a lot of kindred spirit. Um, in her senior year, she volunteered as a reporter for Pacifica Radio, which again is something I listen to all the time. Um, and she, as part of her studies, joined the Varenza Benzeremos Brigade, harvesting sugar in Cuba. You know, she just, she just did all of the activist possibilities open to her in her time of life. She inherited the family's rent control apartment on uh, Manhattan's west side overlooking Central Park. How lovely for her. Um, she felt different or estranged, particularly in relation to her sexuality, her relationships, and her mind. She realized how common these thoughts and fears were among women when she joined the feminist consciousness <coughs> Rights and Group in 72. Discussions of life, politics, and spirituality in another group that included men also helped her to overcome some of her negative feelings about her body. That group also brought her into contact with the expanding pagan community in America. She started reporting for WBAI in New York City. She developed and hosted Hour of the Wolf, a science fiction program, and uh, Science, Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness. She was a frequent contributor on the nationally syndicated NPR shows, All Things Considered, and Morning Edition. She also hosted the weekly uh, uh, national public radio show, <coughs> Talking, from 1999 to 2008. So in our times, Margo Adler has been someone who has opened, opened the eyes of the world to um, a much broader sense of religious, <coughs> religious uh, theology is possible to all of us. 
Her faith in politics and protest, protest waned when she shifted her focus to nature and the environment. She was moved deeply uh, by the works of environmental scientists and writers, uh, especially by a series of articles written by John McPhee for The New Yorker that chronicled the wilderness hikes taken by Sierra President John Brower. Um, one of the developers hiking with Brower likened conservationists to druids, which led Margot on a search to learn more about the druids. <laughs> Largely portrayed as sorcerers who opposed the coming of Christianity. But again, she explored different churches and, and realized that that particular view of what druids were was inaccurate in the, in the real, real world. She was enthralled by the Quakers, the ritual of the Catholics, and ultimately found those belief systems foreign and dogmatic. She felt a close affinity to the earth-centered worship of pagan ceremonies, which may also have reminded her of her early attraction to gods and goddesses. These bad fantasies enabled to contact stronger parts of myself to embolden my vision for myself. In the 70s, Adler interviewed hundreds of people and gathered a wide variety of documents in order to capture and describe the full range of contemporary and historical pagan practices. When she returned, she interviewed uh, druids, witches, and pagans. When she returned to New York, she joined a coven. She shared this research in her book, Drawing Down the Moon, Witches, Druids, Goddess Worshippers, and Other Pagans in America Today, that came out in 1979. She was awarded the prestigious Neiman Fellowship at Harvard in 1982. Male journalists, especially print journalists, had dominated the Neiman program for years. Adler found herself in the minority, both as a woman among men and as a radio personality in a group dominated by print journalists. Adler's partner in life was John Gildman. He, like Adler, he was the child of a psychiatrist. They lived in an apartment overlooking, in the apartment overlooking Central Park, and they bought it when it was turned into a condominium. They held a commitment ceremony and were married in, um, um, in 1997, Adler published Heretic's Heart, A Journey Through Spirit and Revolution. Um, it's a memoir of her life and experiences in the 60s and 70s, with a trove of family letters and documents her mother had stashed away. Adler saw paganism as a spiritual side of feminism, which rejected the hierarchy of monotheism. She thought monotheism was imperialism in religion. In 2005, Adler spoke at the annual Southwest Unitarian Universalists Women's Conference in Houston, Texas. There was still some resistance in Unitarian Universalist women's circles toward the pagan movement, despite the fact that spiritual teachings of Earth-centered traditions had been named the sixth source of our Unitarian Universalist living tradition. In her talk, Ad Adler explained how much pagan spirituality and ritual had contributed to Unitarian Universalist wish worship. From croning and water ceremonies to walking the labyrinth, spiral dances and drumming, and perhaps mo most importantly for Margot, chanting, a practice she often introduced at women's gatherings. I'm not going to go on too long, um, and I have to end here, but there's so much more <laughs> about this fascinating person. Um, and and the last thing I'm going to say is the last person I'm going to bring to the attention of those in the room is a woman, Mavis Jemaluda, who um, was a fairy godmother to Dale and I. And Mavis, um, I met Mavis when she was 81. She was a member of the World Congress of Religions the National Association for Religious Freedom, the International Association, IAR, for, for Religious Freedom, the um, Commonwealth Society, the um, Committee for Racial Justice, and um, 
the World Congress of Religions. Many, many people in these stories attended groups of them variously during their histories. But Mavis was a member of all of them. And she went, she, by she, 1980, by 1980, 1998, uh, when she was 81, she was um, developing post-polio syndrome. But she still traveled all over Vancouver on her bus pass, attending the meetings of all of those organizations, collecting their information uh, that should be of use to various peoples that she knew in the Unitarian Church. And she would sit in the corner of the church every Sunday at her little table with all of this material put out around her. And she would call different members of the church during the, the um, uh, gathering time in Hewitt Center after the service. She would say, you know, so-and-so, come here, I have something for you. And she would give them the piece of information that she had found in her travels that would be particularly salient to those individuals mm -hmm. and useful to them in their work. Um, and she did that till she was over 90 and to the point where she finally accepted using a walker. But she was, uh, she had studied in, at the University of Toronto many, many, many eons ago to become an occupational therapist. And so she understood what was happening to her body. Uh, and, and because she was an occupational therapist, she developed a certain kind of walking that allowed her to keep walking <laughs> regularly for all of those years, for many of them. Finally, she used the uh, walker so that she could sit down and rest when she needed to at a bus stop or somewhere. Stonehenge, you meant the walking. Stonehenge. And she just, she, because she couldn't, you, her muscles didn't allow her to use her legs, she just used her whole body to move those legs. Mm -hmm. Just, she was unbelievably uh, dedicated and committed, but she didn't just belong to those organizations, she traveled the world. Early in her life, her father was a um, was a, a tree biologist who worked all over Africa, helping them, you know, plant trees and such. And she went with him uh, in this caravan where they traveled around Africa in this little caravan. And she met all of these people and their religious practices. And and then she started traveling in the Middle East, and she learned all of their religious practices. She was a true Unitarian bringing um, an understanding of, you know, everyone has a belief system, and they're different everywhere in the world, but <clears throat> there is a basis for many of them, and that basis is love. And so, hence why I chose Melvina Reynolds to open our, mm -hmm. our, our day. I think we're just gonna leave it there. <laughs> um, and I- How old did she get to be? She got to be 92, and her, she had a fall when she was 92, and her, and her son, rather than having, we lived with her for quite a while. Um, we moved back in with her when she had her first fall, uh, so that we could just, you know, take care of everything. And then I came up here and Dale stayed, um, and then her, sort of, you could call him her nephew, but she wasn't exactly related, but friend of family, nephew. Um, please. Um, I took over, and he had just come back from chef school, and so he fed her beautifully. Um, but her son got these weird things in his head about who we are and who, you know, the nephew, and he, he grew up with the nephew, right? The two of them were, you know, friends. They're, you know, um, but he had, he put her in a home. He didn't want to have to worry about her. He lived in Minnesota. He didn't want to have to worry about her here. He put her in a home, and she died not very long after that. It was horrible. I used to visit her there in the home, and it was not a wonderful place. Well, I mean, it's not a horrible place, but 
She had nothing. We all, uh, he, he took, she kept, she kept copious diaries every day. She would write about everything in the diary. He put her in the home after he had to fall, and, and she never saw her home again. And all of her books, all of her, her, her diaries, her, her, her life was taken away from her. <coughs> and, and I just, it just made me so mad. <laughs> and, um, but anyway, shortly before she died, I was visiting her. And, um, you know, I, I go down to the coast fairly regularly. And, and I went in to see her at lunchtime. And instead of sitting over there at this table with this First Nations man who never said a word to her the whole time, and they were assigned these seats, she was sitting with, and what was his name? I don't have it in the top of my head, but he was uh, the person in charge of the multi-faith action. Oh, that was the other society to which she belonged, the multi-faith action society in, 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 uh, in Vancouver. And he was, he was the person who was the executive director <coughs> of the multi-faith action society. And they were very, very good friends all these years. And there she was, sitting at a table with him. He had just been moved into the home. And, and so they, you know, they had weeks together, very short weeks together, of, of conversation and thought and ideas. And then I read in the paper that he had died. And I wrote to his son. And I told his son about the fact that they had been with Mavis all, all that later time. And he said something back. He was very happy to hear that. But so at the very end, it was good. <laughs> Thank you all for listening. Thank you. And what was her name again? Mavis Gemelita. Um, she was married to. She met on one of on one of those freighter ships that she would travel to to Africa on. She she met Sparky, who, who was the Gemelita. Sparky Gemelita. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah, Sparky was the, I can't remember his real name, but that, you know, he, he was the radio guy on the, on the ship. And they met and they fell in love and uh, ultimately they married. And uh, when he came back, they moved, to, they moved into a house in Vancouver that they had built, which is where we stayed. And, um, and Sparky started the first, um, um, cable business in Vancouver and there were two people two different cable companies that started at almost the same time but his was the first and uh, so a communicator <laughs> yeah um, Mavis Mavis Maud Mavis Maud Gemelita was her name yeah. and and her maiden name her maiden name came from uh, her family was based in the Okanagan, um, but I, I, I can get you her, her maiden name, which I don't keep in the top of my head. <laughs> but thank you for letting me share all of this with you. Thank you. Thank you. So you won't get any more of that right now. <laughs> but thank you for asking for it again. <laughs> uh, so perhaps we can stand and Right. Oh, and announcements. We have announcements. Okay. Ah, yes. We'll suspend the flame from now until we light it again next week. And next week, we will have a very busy weekend. And I hope the flame continues to burn in everyone's heart till then. Everybody come together. Okay. Carry the flame.
I don't know. Don't know. No. What, <laughs> what do we? Go now in peace. Go, go now, now in peace. Go now in peace. May the spirit of love surround you everywhere, everywhere. They're little flyers, so I invite you to invite um, your friends to our uh, belonging ceremony next Sunday here. Um, we can you can invite uh, you can get them one of these flyers and pass these around. Um, they're no good after next Sunday. So. Okay. Um, uh, so you can invite anybody, and those who are, are ready to join, these are the these are the fuller ones. Those who are ready to join will join next Sunday. And become members, but uh, there's no need, there's no compulsion to join, and everybody's more than welcome to come. I'm inviting friends to come and join us just to, wit to be witness as we, as we, as we become members. Um, on Saturday, next Saturday, uh, I, I think we're starting at one or two? At two. Uh, at two. Uh, we're having a workshop here um, with, um, with uh, Deborah. Carolyn. 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 Yes. Joan Carolyn. Joan Carolyn. Joan yes. Carolyn. There we go. We're having a workshop here uh, all about... Jo Joan, is, um, Joan is the uh, Canadian Unitarian Council. Um, is she the executive director? Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh is that right? Yeah. And uh, so she's coming out and we'll be here for the weekend and she's going to be facilitating the workshop. Oh. So she's from, from Winnipeg. From Winnipeg. Yeah. Ooh, is it written here? Yes, it's the very, very bottom. Oh, this one. And that's the potluck. The workshop is here. Okay. Two to four, Saturday, October twenty-first. Okay, and then we're having a potluck at uh, Michael and, and uh, yeah. Julie. Julie. After yeah. that. Yeah. And what time at Michael's? Five. Yeah. About five, five thirty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then on the Sunday after the service, we're going across. Over to the co-op, right? And Upstairs. Uh, up we've there. got the space booked in the cafe there to right. have a social, a little bit of a social immediately after yeah. the service, and rather than waiting here coffee because coffee and, and tea. Coffee. Yeah. 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 yeah, and that should be really nice. I think so. And it looks like, and people are really um, welcome to come for the whether you're going to become a member or not. I found in my in my study of all of the people that I've been looking at that um, some some are Unitarians and they sign the membership book. Some see themselves as friends of Unitarians and some of them sign their friends book. And others are just associates and supporters of everything. And all of those people are welcome to come. Okay. And what, what do we want in the paper besides Deborah Thorne? On Sunday, mm -hmm. the speaker is Deborah Thorne, and the topic is the, a belonging ceremony. Or is that how does that sound? Just yeah. belonging and membership. Yeah. yeah, membership and belonging. I think well, membership and belonging. I would rather just say belonging. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that no, because yeah. Mike Michael did a session on belonging. Okay. And this is actually about okay, okay. membership, membership mm -hmm. and belonging. Membership yeah. ceremony. Membership ceremony. I think we should yeah. ask Deborah what the title is. That might be a good idea. She mm -hmm. has an. She's good. For it. <laughs> she, she's very good. Okay. So you, you, you want to email her and ask her? Okay. Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah, we had a move. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they're coming in. But I also wanted to say that on Tuesday, Tuesday, the 14th of November, we're having our member of Parliament, Wayne Stetsky, here. Uh, and, and as this the attorney, uh, no, November 14th. And what time is it? It'll be at 7 o'clock okay. here. So we're we talking about uh, the math and the book.